A dad didn't brush his teeth for 40 days. This is what happened to his kidneys. CJ is a 46-year-old man presenting to the emergency room with excessive thirst, abdominal discomfort, and shortness of breath. He tells the admitting nurse that he had lost 15 pounds over the last two weeks and had developed a pounding toothache. You see, CJ was a dad who had lost everything. Earlier in his life, he was a successful engineer with a happy family. Five years ago, on his 41st birthday, CJ lost his five-year-old son in a sudden freak accident. He returned to work from bereavement leave, only to find out that he was laid off. His wife, unable to cope with the tragedy, left him before year's end. Bankrupt and unable to find new work, CJ was forced into government housing in a poor part of town. He found comfort and affordability in certain foods and gained over 250 pounds in four years. About two months ago, CJ's mother, his last sense of hope in family, passed away and in his sadness, he laid in bed all day, only getting up to go to the convenience store to eat. He no longer cared for his own personal hygiene, no longer brushed his teeth, no longer bathed. Over the next few weeks, he noticed something wrong when he had an unquenchable thirst. Because juice is fruit, it must be healthy, so drink more of it, he thought. One day, he drank two gallons of juice and urinated every 15 minutes. Just a lot of extra liquid, he thought. On the surface, CJ didn't appear to be well. He had glucosuria, or sugar, in his urine. This was combined with his polydipsia, his unquenchable thirst, and polyuria, his frequent urination. His face was turgid, swollen, and bloated. Evaluation of his oral cavity found an infected tooth, which inflamed his oral mucosa and formed multiple pustules along his gums, all because he no longer found it necessary to brush his teeth. A blood test reveals CJ's blood glucose level is 800 milligrams per deciliter, more than 10 times that of normal. In the emergency room, CJ becomes more lethargic. His toothache was pounding. His blood pressure was dropping, and in the wait for medical care, he finally collapses into coma. Given this past history, there are several clues as to what's going on. Most immediately, CJ is suffering from hyperglycemic crisis. Hyper, meaning high. Glyce, referring to glucose or sugar, the primary source of energy for cells, and emia, meaning presence in blood. High glucose presence in blood and crisis, meaning that there was an underlying cascade of events that brought about CJ's metabolic derangement, which leads us to the first clue. Because he was urinating every 15 minutes, there was a substantial net flow of water out of his body. His urine has a lesser concentration of sugar in it compared to the juice, which means that glucose is accumulating and concentrating in his blood. We can prove this. Because CJ weighed over 400 pounds at admission, his estimated blood volume was about 9 liters. Given his blood glucose level of 800 milligrams per deciliter, there are 72 grams, almost one-fifth pound of sugar, floating around in the blood. The average amount for a healthy man weighing around 175 pounds is 4 grams, 18 times less than CJ. Because CJ drank 2 gallons of juice, which amounted to 850 grams of sugar, and 72 are present in his blood, then where are the other 700 grams? Well. There's a bit of basic human physiology to be known here. When you eat, food goes into your stomach, then to the small intestines, where fats, proteins, and sugars absorb through the liver, then are delivered to the body through the blood. Glucose enters cells because the body releases a hormone named insulin into circulation in response to food, shifting sugar into muscle, liver, and fat tissue for storage. The problem with CJ is that both his diet and his class 3 obesity, defined by his body mass index, allowed for massive disturbances in high blood glucose levels based on his choice and amount of foods. This caused an overabundance of insulin to be in his blood constantly. Because cells don't want this continuous influx of glucose, they downregulate or decrease the number of insulin receptors, meaning they won't accept as much sugar from the blood, leaving it floating around as they become increasingly insulin resistant. Over the last four years, CJ, through his diet and bountiful sugary and fatty foods, 
saturated his tissues with glucose and his body converted those stores to fat. Unable to handle the overabundance of sugar, the body left it in the blood to accumulate where it inevitably overloaded the kidneys and began to spill into the urine, explaining CJ's glucosuria. This is the chronic or long-term physiologic consequence of CJ's gross hyperglycemia, but there's also a life-threatening chemical consequence as well. CJ is in hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. Hyperosmolar, describing the chemistry responsible for what's happening. The interesting thing about glucose is that it creates an osmotic gradient, which means wherever it is, water will flow towards it. In this small science experiment, I fill an outside pool with sugar water. I submerge a tube with distilled sugar-free water, and you'll see that the water leaves the tube, that water flows towards the sugar. So let's go back to the name of CJ's problem, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. Because there's a large glucose presence in blood, sugar is drawing water out of his cells, exerting a hyperosmolar effect. Because cells are losing water, his body thinks that he's dehydrated and release signals to his brain to alert him of the thirst, explaining his polydipsia. Because water is getting drawn into the intravascular space, it increases the flow of water to the kidneys, causing them to filter more urine, explaining his polyuria. The hyperglycemia begins to draw water out of his brain, dehydrating it, causing his neurologic deficits, resulting in coma. As his cells begin to dry out and he persists in excessive urination, his body becomes massively dehydrated, decreasing perfusion to the already dried out kidneys and causing acute kidney injury. With the failure of kidneys, what should be CJ's urine is now floating around in his blood, rotting his bones through an imbalance of calcium and phosphate, altering his brain chemicals through excess nitrogen and disrupting the electrophysiology of his heart through potassium, all because his body could no longer handle glucose. At this point, it's impossible to directly remove the sugar from his blood. Even if we drained CJ's body and transfused in fresh euglycemic blood, it too would become hyperglycemic to the point of crisis because the pathogenesis of hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state is metabolic in nature. All of this precipitated by CJ's abscessed tooth. Because CJ hadn't brushed his teeth for 40 days, his tooth became inflamed and infected. This infection seeped into his gums and began to spill into his systemic circulation and spread throughout his body, causing septicemia, a bacterial presence in blood. This forced his immune system to activate and caused adrenaline to release in response to the physiologic stress. Because adrenaline is usually released when you get scared or excited, it forces the liver and muscles, sites of storage for glucose, to quickly release sugar into the blood. This makes sense because to fuel a fight or flight response, you need sugar in the blood for cells to generate mechanical energy, but its release is inappropriate in CJ, meaning his hyperglycemia was not only onset by the juice he drank and his overall diet, but was amplified by his own body through physiologic stress induced by poor oral hygiene. If this continues untreated, the electrolyte abnormalities onset by renal failure through dehydration will cause cardiac arrhythmias and lead to sudden death. The notion of metabolic derangement arising from hyperglycemic crisis was observed thousands of years ago. In 1500 BC, ancient Egyptian physicians wrote about a too great emptying of the urine that attracted ants. It was later found that sugar was responsible for attracting the insects. Ancient Chinese medical texts describe sugar urine disease, whose pronunciation Tang Niao Bing preserved into Japanese and Korean. We know this today to be diabetes and the hyperglycemic crisis alone is sufficient to diagnose CJ with type two diabetes, the disorder where the body does create insulin but doesn't respond to it. Contrast this with type one diabetes where the body doesn't create insulin at all. The notion of diabetic coma was first described in Western literature in 1828 by German physician August von Stasch, who described severe polydipsia, polyuria, and glucosuria followed by decline in mental status leading to death. In the early 1900s, a diabetes diagnosis was a death sentence. Without insulin, patients would inevitably suffer hyperglycemia from eating, causing dehydration, kidney injury, and coma leading to death. 
It was only in 1921 when Canadian physician Frederick Banting and group extracted insulin from cows that diabetes became a chronic, treatable illness. It wasn't until 1957 when humans finally understood that the pathogenesis and etiology of coma and kidney injury in hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar state were due to extracellular hypotonicity and cellular dehydration arising from underlying metabolic derangement, accompanied with a major precipitating factor. For CJ, we treat his condition first by treating his infection with antibiotics, and in his case, the abscessed tooth was removed. Because his blood was hyperosmolar due to glucose, we dilute his blood by infusing water into his veins. Rehydration efforts will amount to as much as 20 liters given over 48 hours. This will mitigate his dehydration and reduce the plasma osmolality that was onset by hyperglycemia and begin to perfuse the kidneys, delivering oxygen to the tissue, alleviating acute injury, allowing them to filter urine and remove wastes while restoring water back into the cells. With the physiologic stress removed on treatment of his tooth, some insulin sensitivity will be restored and administering insulin intravenously will allow more water to shift back into the cells as well as replete potassium, an electrolyte which was forced out of the cell during hyperglycemic crisis and excreted in large quantities during polyuria. Today, we have sophisticated therapies and techniques to treat diabetes. We have drugs that sensitize cells to insulin. Before 1977, insulin was originally derived from grinding pig and cow pancreas. That would inevitably cause allergic reactions after long-term use. But after 1980, we have genetically engineered E. coli bacteria with recombinant human DNA, enabling them to produce human insulin in unadulterated form. This paved the way for short and long-acting insulin analogs to alleviate acute and chronic aberrations in glycemic levels and helps maintain glucose control in the elderly, where hypoglycemia onset from incorrect insulin doses will cause dizziness and loss of consciousness, leading to falls, shattering bones and hips, leading to increased mortality in the elderly. Despite all of these techniques, tragedies from underlying metabolic derangements will still happen from more factors than anybody can imagine. Whether it be a gap or dislocation in medical care, a disruptive culture, or simply a decline in lifestyle for various reasons, the causes are not simple. The data today shows, as metabolism slow when one begins to age, high body fat percentage, bordering on obesity, along with a decreased volume of total body water and atrophy of skeletal muscle, is almost inevitable for a majority of people as they enter into adulthood but that doesn't mean to ignore your health when you are young either. With continued monitoring in the ICU, counseling and social support to bring CJ back from the brink and a new hope to regain status in his life once again, CJ was able to make a full recovery. Thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourself and be well.